the edge with April Mahoney brains. Here, this is the place where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. <laughs> Welcome home, brains. Coming to you straight from San Diego, California. Let's welcome our host, April Mahoney. Yeah, I've done it before Zoom with friends. Oh, yeah, I know. And it's just crazy. But if you, yeah. do, you don't hit record, it's ugly. So I know. I'm so excited to have you here. You don't know what an honor it is. Everybody's tossed around that word privilege. But this is a privilege to have oh, you in you. the house with me on the edge, uh, Maladin. Okay? Thank I think you so much. You're just... You're just a superstar and boxing is one of my favorite all-time sports yes i'm glad to hear that yeah so i want to welcome you uh maladin monster melius to on the edge with april mahoney brains there he is right there that's Can canada's heavyweight champion okay he is skilled he is talented I was supposed to meet your mom in Las Vegas to come to one yeah. of your fights and then the stupid corona. I know. Everyone's dealing with it. Everyone's going through it in their own way. I know. And so how are you going through it? How are you handling this? Because you're looking lean. You're working out. That's good. I'm, I'm working out. I've been working out. That's one thing I made sure I kept consistent during this whole coronavirus and lockdown situation. Yeah. But um, the, the, boxing, the boxing gym just opened up back here uh, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm back in the gym now and getting back into the swing of things. Uh, literally in the swing of things. Yes. I have some boxing gloves. I've always wanted to learn how to do the bag, though. I can't get my timing right. Oh, the speed bag. The speed bag, yeah. You know, I, I could teach it pretty easily. Really? It's, you... it's, all, it's all about rhythm. Just getting that rhythm going. Once you have that rhythm, you get it slow, then you can speed it up little by little. Kind of like life. You got to slow down and then kind of get that rhythm step, and speed it step up. Step by step, exactly. <laughs> well, tell my brains, that's what they're called here on the edge. Tell them a little bit about your story, uh, Maladin, and how you um, found boxing or how boxing found you. Yeah. Well, growing up in Canada, I always loved playing all sports. You know, I played almost all sports you can think of from football to basketball, mostly contact sports like rugby, wrestling. I've done martial arts since I was four years old and growing up in school, I was always getting into a lot of fights and a lot of altercations. And I found that that's a very negative way to get that out. So I found boxing and boxing really channeled me and changed my life around. It gave me something positive to put my energy into. And you know, it, that transferred over into all areas of my life. Because it is a discipline. It's a skill, you know, um, I don't know if I'm into this, what is it called? M-A-A, M-M-A? M-M-A, yeah. It seems a little barbaric, <laughs> you know, the blood well, and all. You know, it's, it's funny because I get asked that a lot because I have a, a karate background from since I was very young and a wrestling background. And people always say, you know, why don't you go into MMA or UFC? And for me, I love the gentleman aspect of boxing. It's a gentleman sport. For example, if someone knocks you down, you have 10 seconds to get back up on your own. You don't have somebody on top of you punching your head in. Right. And it's not, you know, it's blood, you know, if you get hit pretty good. But it yeah. just seems like it's just a different type of skill. It's a mixed martial arts, isn't it? Kind of wrestling, yeah. boxing, and martial arts combined. You, ha you have to know everything. If, if you don't, you know, you're going to get hurt in there. It's a completely different sport. It's like comparing football to rugby to me. You know, I, I respect I respect the athletes. I respect the sport. I do watch the sport here and there, but for me personally, if I'm going to be competing in something, I'd rather compete in boxing. Right. Well, boxing goes back a long way. There's a long history there, and so you said that you had um, gotten to a lot of altercations. Your mom had mentioned in her interview a little bit that you were bullied as a kid. Yes. You know, since since I was a kid, I was always the odd one out, the biggest one in my class, and. I always felt different as a child, but I never cared what anyone thought about me. I always did what I thought I wanted to do and right. really mind my own business. And yeah, a lot of times I'll get into fights, I'll get bullied and stuff, but you know, I wouldn't change my childhood for anything. It really made me stronger today going through right. those experiences. Well, I think all of us have experienced bullying. Every, you know, everybody's been bullied in some way, for sure. 
but that makes you tough and that gives you uh, some social skills and that teaches you your boundaries and it teaches you how to be aware, uh, you know, and how to treat other people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you moved into boxing and um, you developed these strong skills and this, this mindset. I want to talk to you a little bit about the mindset of a boxer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because everyone right now is so full of rage of what's going on in the world. I want you to give us some suggestions um, and some techniques that you use to channel that rage because it's very skilled. I mean, you know, I know there's some trash talking in that ring that we can't see, you know, yeah. we're going to talk about Muhammad Ali later, hmm. uh, but there's some trash talking in there and there's some trash talking when you go to weigh in and you have to, you know, be a gentleman. But then when you get in there, you have to be a monster. Yeah. How do you channel that rage? How do you turn it on and turn it off? Well, you know, my old amateur coach taught me a couple of things in the ring. Number one, don't show anger. Don't show your hurt. Don't show emotion. You have to be very stoic and very centered always. And that's actually why my nickname is Monster. I try to be as nice as I can, as positive as I can be outside the ring. And all my evil, all my hurt, I say that for inside the ring. And, you know, I take that out of my opponent. And I really don't have any remorse for them because uh-huh. they're, try- they're trying to do the same to me. Right. But, you know, I found that I have that avenue to do that. Well, but it takes a whole, um, it takes a lot to be able to, to decompress. Yeah. You know, I know that whatever you might have been experiencing during the week or, you know, uh, the trash talking, whatever it is, it all impacts us. So how, as me, as a black woman, and my species is being hunted and hung and all this kind of stuff, how do I channel my rage? How would you give me some suggestions to channel my rage in a positive way? Well, I'm just going to put it back to boxing again for me. You know, if I'm not boxing, I'm not a happy person. If I don't have fights coming up, you can ask my family, I'm pretty miserable. Like for me, you need something in life to put all your energy and negative energy into. You know, some people, some people use alcohol. Some people use drugs. Some people take it on their loved ones. You know, those aren't healthy avenues to do that. You know, whatever pain you're having, find something positive to put it into. Don't make it such a negative. You know, it doesn't have to be boxing. It can be any activity, you know, be involved in your community, do something positive, do something charitable. You know, these are all things that you can turn your negativity into something that has a positive impact on the world. We have to do that. And we have to uh, work with our children because our children are really, really at risk. So let me tell you my Muhammad Ali stories. Mm -hmm. The very first time I met him, I was driving down Wilshire Boulevard. And I looked over in my window to the right, and there was this handsome man in this big, beautiful car. I look over, and I see this handsome man in a big, white Rolls Royce. Mm. I looked, and I said, that's Muhammad Ali. I couldn't believe it. And he could see me mouthing, it's Muhammad Ali. And he winked at me, and he did like this. And I pulled over and he gave me his autograph. He had his three kids in the back. He was so, so wonderful. You know, that sounds just like him, actually, from what I've heard. He loved to give his autograph. He loved to be personable. But the second time was the best. Now, there was a community gym once upon a time when police officers were revered, when people Mm. loved them. They would always be at this community gym. And they were boxing there. And who comes in but the goat? Oh, yes. Yeah. And I said, Muhammad Ali, he goes, I've seen you somewhere before. And my heart started to flutter. I was like, he remembered little old me out of all the people that he meets all around the world. And he gave me this picture of him. Nice. Beautiful. He asked me, he says, am I pretty? And I said, <laughs> I said, yes. He says, do I float like a butterfly and sting like a bee? I says, yes. He says, who's the greatest? I said, you are. Hmm. See, that was the mindset, Maladin, is that you have to believe it. All of these people that have this entourage and have this notoriety, it's the talk up. And if I can't make you believe it and I don't believe it, it'll never manifest. Yeah, he spoke it before he achieved it. He said he was the greatest before he was. He spoke it into existence, and he kept speaking it, and he made you believe it. And he was a man of integrity. You have a couple stories that your coach told told you about him. What did he say? 
Yeah, so my coach actually had the privilege of being a sparring partner during Muhammad's career. And he spent lots of time in training camp with him. And he told me all these stories, how they would spend all day in the gym. And after the gym, Ali would be doing magic tricks and they would spend the evening riding horses. He just said it was such a great time for him in his life. And, you know, he tells me another story similar to yours. They were in New York City and they were driving from a hotel to a venue. And traffic was so big that Muhammad gets out the car and starts walking. Everyone's like, what's he doing, right? They start walking with him. Everyone starts recognizing him on the streets. He stopped and signed every single autograph, took every single picture till he got there. You know, it might've been like a thousand people, but he made sure every single person, you know, got that experience with him. And, you know, to me, that's what I think made him the greatest. Aside from what he did in the ring, is what he did outside the ring, you know, that made him transcend the sport. He was more, more than an athlete, more than a boxer. He, he was, was such a positive figure. He was, and he lived this. And who yeah. would think 40 years later that we would still be fighting the same civil war yeah. um, society against African-American people? But I don't know if you got to see his memorial service. It was so multicultural. You yeah. know, uh, everyone came out. He had mm -hmm. everyone from all different faiths speak on his behalf. He was, yeah. again, he was the greatest of all time. I really yeah. believe that. So now you are in Las Vegas. Have you been able to run into that Mike Tyson? I heard that he's working out again. Yeah, but he's pretty quiet. You know, apparently he lives in Las Vegas, but nobody ever hears of him being around too much. It well, seems it seems like he really quieted down and settled down his life a lot as he's gotten older. I saw him too. We were at a, a resort up in Palos Verdes and he was there with his family. And he too, he was very gracious. He was very yeah. kind. Um, and, you know, I didn't even have the nerve to ask him to take a picture. He was with his family. Yeah. You know, and so I respect and I honor that. But I'd love to see him because he was a very skilled fighter, too, that came from a very uh, broken childhood. So, you know, I, I think it's a little bit tough for him, too, with the upbringing he had. You know, some people really don't do their research. If you research the upbringing that Mike Tyson had, actually, my coach, my coach from the same neighborhood as him, Brownsville, Brooklyn. And he knew, he knew Mike as a child. And, you know, it's a very hard upbringing. And imagine being thrust into the center stage of the world on camera, you know, recording all your bad things, all your good things, making it seem worse than it is. It's very hard for him to come out of those circumstances. And if you actually follow him now, he grew so much as a man. And now he spreads such a positive message to people. Mm -hmm. And then, too, that in addition to a whole bunch of money... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, that, you, that you never had before. Yeah. The, the sport of boxing has really changed. You know, again, like you said, it's a gentleman's sport. You don't see as many athletes going into that. You know, you see it in the Olympics, but it mm. used to be Sugar Ray Leonard and, yeah. you know, uh, Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, yeah. George Foreman. You had yeah. all these great boxers. You don't hear it as much anymore. Do you find mm. that the sport? The, the uh, sport is diminishing, or where do you find it's at right now? You know, I think it's all a business thing. If you look at boxing in the 60s up until the early early 90s, late 80s, it was free on TV. It was on NBC Sports, CBS, on all the sports stations. Now, it's all a pay-per-view model. You know, you have to pay to see. And it's not really going to get that out to general public. You know, boxing as a world sport still makes a tremendous amount of money. But as far as being an everyday household, not so much. Yeah, because, uh, and you get really mad if you have a party. <laughs> yeah. And the opponent gets knocked out in the second round. You are pissed yeah. off because you're like, what are we going to do? We need to get through all the nachos and the beer. And See, for, for, for me and my fights, that's how I want all of them to go. But I promise a very entertaining two rounds. Wow. The most entertaining two rounds you'll see. But right. I don't want any more than that. All right. I like to see him dance. You know, another thing I like to see boxers do, skip rope. I love skipping rope. That is really It's a great, great, great thing to do. Actually, similar, similar to the, the bag I was telling you, to teach someone that, I teach them how to skip first. Because when you start to learn to skip, you don't start skipping fast. You go one at a time. One, two, and you pick up your pace. Same thing with that bag. Okay. get that rhythm and then you speed it up same thing with skipping skipping is one of the greatest things for boxing because boxing is all rhythm if your feet are in rhythm then your body will be in rhythm okay. so skipping is very important 
All right. So now you are Canada's heavyweight champion. Who does yes. that? You? Look at you. Yes. <laughs> you said no hair, but now I have the hair. Thank I you. love it. I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, and so Canada's heavyweight champion of, well, heavyweight champion. Can't yes. say heavyweight champion of the world because you haven't taken the world title yet. Tell Not me yet. How, that, how that goes. How do they rank that? So there's actually four world titles in boxing, four different sanctioning bodies, and each one of them has a top 10 ranking system. So the champion has to fight the number one contender every year, year and a half. So basically what you want to do is get in the ranking system. I'm already ranked 14th in the world by one of them. So my goal is just to keep going higher and higher in the rankings until I'm a mandatory challenger for a belt. Wow. It's, it's very political, the system in boxing. And <laughs> really? What is it's, it political? Uh, exactly, right? You know, it's, it's funny. If you look at some of the rankings, you'll have a guy in one of them ranked number one or two, but in the other one not ranked at all. Really? Yeah. So you kind of have to pick and choose which route you go in a certain way. Wow. And so then you said there's still a lot of money in boxing? There is, but, but at the top of the sport. I would say the top 1% make a lot of money. The rest, no. Like for me personally, I don't make a lot of money boxing. Not yet. But for me, it's not about the money at all. No, it's not. It's you about know, you, the skill. It's about the dream. You know, since I was a kid, I've always been a dreamer. I've never been afraid to dream. Mm. You know, I used to play football as a kid. I wanted to make it to the NFL. You know, I, I used to swim. I wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist. That's just, that's just me. If I'm going to do something... I try to be the best at it and make sure I enjoy it. As long as I'm enjoying boxing, my goal is to support my family off of it, of course. You know, then that would be perfect for me. That's my goal. Right. Well, you know, but there's a lot of liability too there, monster. Okay. Yeah, there is. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of injuries and, you know, a lot of cuts to your pretty face and losing yeah. your teeth, you know, dementia. I'm, I'm lucky. I haven't had any, any injuries or anything yet, but the good thing about boxing that a lot of people don't know is every year there's a lot of medicals we have to do. So we have a license to box mm -hmm. and every year we have medicals. We have to do a brain scan, a CT scan, okay. uh, a different, a different test on our heart, a test to see our nerve reactions, a full physical. And if there's like any spots on your brain, any, anything like that, they won't license you to box. You know, okay. but the one down part is you have to pay for all that yourself as a boxer. You, you have, have to medical pay medical insurance? <laughs> well, you, you can get your own medical insurance, but, you know, that, that's the thing about boxing. Other sports like NFL, football, baseball, basketball, you're on a team, you have a contract. You know, let's just say if you tear your knee, they pay for your surgery, they send you to the best doctor. In boxing, you're on your own. Wow. Yeah. That's that's a huge liability. Yeah, it but, is. Yeah, and it's, it's a gentleman's sport. Now, you're 6'6", six, six, right? Yes. So I bet you have a monster reach, too. Yeah, like, long, long reach, long I do. And so I'm, that can I'm, always be a benefit, but then, you know, if you've got an opponent that's a little, you know, a little shorter, a little stockier, he could probably work you on the body side. That's the, the that's problem. We have a long arm. If you, if you miss a punch, it's a long way to come back, and you can get caught in between. So being a tall fighter, you want to learn how to use your reach really well, which I'm still learning because I, I've, I've been growing recently. I'm still growing. It's crazy. But I'm, I'm getting used to my size little by little. Well, now how long have you been boxing? Um, 12 years, 11 years. Wow. So now what does your woman say about this? You know, she, because I know she's a nervous wreck every time you go in there into the ring and everybody's yeah. looking for you to be knocked out not knocked down but knocked out yeah so it's funny i actually met her through my boxing really is she I a had to, too? <laughs> uh well i actually met her in a medical clinic i had to get a, a a hand x-ray done so i went to this clinic and there's this lovely older lady there at the reception that owns the clinic and she was so nice I actually had her phone number and she was talking to me about her daughter Oh, you know, so, so the next day I came in, she, my fiance now was there and, you know, we hit it off, we exchanged phone numbers and she basically would take care of all the boxing medicals. And from there we started a relationship and now we're living together and looking to get married and start our own family. Oh, do you think that you'll continue boxing when you become a father? Even more, 
you know, I want to, I want to box for my kids to give them a life better than I had. You know, I'm boxing, I'm boxing now for my family. Even now I don't have children, but every time I step into a ring, my last name is up there. You know, all my family, my brother, my father, my mother, I want them to be able to walk down the street and be proud of who I am, be proud of how I represent our family. You know, so that's a very, very important thing for me. Well, your mother is proud of you because the first thing I met her, <clears throat> the first time I met her, she says, oh, and my son, he is Canada's heavyweight champion. And I was like, oh, right. I can't wait to meet him. because she, she won't watch my fights, though, but she supports it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's her baby. I, I understand. I, I couldn't do it either. I couldn't do it either. But uh, it's a lot. So can you give us some words of encouragement? Um, something to keep us motivated and inspired because you are a deeply committed man. You are, you know, very, I, I can feel your spirit exuding. I can feel your passion, you know, your love, your compassion, but yet and still you are a monster. <laughs> yes. At the right time and place. That's right. So what, how would you encourage us? You know, I think the whole world is going through such a difficult time right now. And it's actually historical times. You know, at first we're all going through this coronavirus pandemic and being home and this and that. But, you know, the whole thing with the whole protests and the racial problems, I think is even way bigger than any coronavirus. And one thing we have to do is realize we're all in this together. We are all suffering in our own way. Right. Instead of being so hard on each other, be easy on each other. Mm -hmm. And even with all the protests and stuff going on, I believe it starts like this, me talking with you, me going to the grocery store, holding the door open for that person, being kind, you know, be kind to one another. And very slowly, that's the only way the world's going to change It's with individuals coming together to make the whole better. And that's what I say to each one, teach one, you know, it's you know, not so. going to be abracadabra. It's not going to, you know, change one way or another overnight. It takes yeah. work. It's like it took work to create this mess. It's going to take work to clean it up. Yeah, but I want to thank you so much um, for being here with me and my brains on the edge with April Mahoney. Uh, you are just a winner. You're a superstar and you are a champion. And I thank, thank you so much. so much again for being here. And if there's anything we can ever do for you, support you. Uh, and when this goes down, I'm coming to watch you. Mama can sit yes. like this. April yeah. can sit like this. <laughs> yeah. you, you can tell her what's going on. That's usually how it goes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So thank, thank you so, you so much, April, for having me. Thank you. All right. Bye, brains.